Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's program. Our guests today are Brad Anderson. He's a 4-H leadership and communication specialist at the 4-H Center for Youth Development with the University of Missouri Extension. Welcome to the podcast, Brad. Glad to be here. And Hunter McBrayer. Hunter is a uh, regional extension agent for Alabama Cooperative Extension. Thanks for joining us, Hunter. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having us. So Brad and Hunter both served on the ECOP Innovation Task Force. Uh, that's the Extension uh, Committee on Organization and Policy, ECOP. Um, I invited them to the podcast uh, for a little bit of a broader uh, conversation about innovation and extension. In the past few weeks, we've talked with Paul Hill and Jamie Sager and Keith Smith about the details of the innovation task force and the resulting report but today I thought we would talk in a little bit more general terms and just kind of get your guys' input on innovation in cooperative extension so Brad maybe we'll start with you what do you think the current state of innovation in cooperative extension is I think we have a lot of really innovative people doing great things um, especially at the local level through partnerships and communities. Um, anybody who works with youth and youth adult partnerships really has opportunities to uh, find innovation in their approach. But collectively, extension-wide, um, I don't think innovation is maybe one of our greatest priorities right now. Hunter, what do you th think about that? Um, and maybe, you know, I guess maybe as a task force member, you have some sense of, of nationally, but even in Alabama, what's the state of, of innovation and cooperative extension? You know, I do a lot of work. I'm a home horticulture agent and animal science boards. So I work with ag guys and gals all day, every day for the most part. And they always just want to do things the same way. And I, that's the story across the board. I've learned that, you know, and, and we've got to work on that. And we've got, we've got to continue to grow that. That's what was exciting about the ECOP committee on, on innovation was just trying to get that to go forward and try to get the conversation started. And I really think it has. And so, but overall, you know, just like with Brad, I see individuals that work really hard to find fresh ideas or to do something cool, but across the board, that's just not the case. People just want to stick and stay where it's comfortable. And that's, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to work in the long term. Why do you think that is, Hunter? I mean, why are people so stuck on sort of how they've always done things? It just works too well. Um, you know, I, I said we, when we were, in, we were in Ohio, I guess a few weeks ago now, Brad, um, with, on a guiding committee, and, and something hit me. I said, extension worked too good for 100 years. It worked too well. We didn't really have to change a lot. I mean, over the last 20 years, you know, we've brought technology in, but for the most part, even though the delivery method might be a little bit different, we're still doing things the same. And that's because we never were faced with a situation where it just didn't work. And we've always been able to do since the, since the beginning of the extension, new things had to be done then. And then they said, man, this is really, this is really great. It works well. And now we've just been able to do the same thing for the last 90 years or hundred years. So. Brad, would you answer that question the same way about why people sort of stick to the, the regular way of doing things. Maybe that's not your experience, especially in, in 4-H. Well, and I think that's the, I think I agree with Hunter. Um, I also think sometimes people who've been doing this for a few years, seasoned extension professionals, uh, they're content to let working programs that work run and continue to chug along, maybe not on autopilot, but uh, with, you know, if, if something works well, you let it go along. You don't have to spend so much time tweaking it. And then that gives you time to do other things, especially if you've been in this profession for a while, you're getting a little bored with the same program after eight years. Um, you know, that gives you an opportunity to explore other things. So I think part of it also is when things are working well, there's a tendency to not want to reinvent them because you want to keep exploring. So if everything's working so well, uh, Brad, what do you think is, what's the compelling reason why we should be worried about innovation and extension? Well, because it's like good improv. I mean, improv is where you try to figure out what you're going to do in a constantly shifting landscape. We are in a profoundly changing time. And like Hunter said, you know, this is a time where things are changing pretty rapidly and drastically. And if we want to continue to be that source of information, 
and to be a relevant organization and to fulfill the extension mission, we have to be current, not only current, we have to be a little bit ahead. So I think that a good part of that is when trying to innovation, we're talking about, you know, infusing our organization with new ideas and uh, new, be able to open to new ways of doing business and supporting and expanding the way we work with new technologies. So, with those ideas, devices, and methods, I think that's just a, a recipe for success. If this was the perfect storm, I'd say we were fitting the ship so that we survived the perfect storm, and maybe not end up like the tuna boat or the other boat in the movie. Uh, how about you, Hunter? What I mean, you agree with that? Are there other reasons why you think we need to be more innovative? Well, I think, you know, that we now, to put it in Brad's way, it's the perfect storm. Not only do we have all this new technology that's changing. I mean, I'm 27, okay? And so things have changed so much just in the last 10 or 12 years that I've seen, you know, I, I remember the days when we had the Nokia brick. Now everybody walks around with, with you know, smartphones. Everything is right at your fingertips. But I think one of the reasons that we haven't really as an extension come along that way is we still have those 25, 30 year people that are in, that are hanging in and there's a place for them. I'm not trying to say that. I don't want to end up on their list, but um, now we're beginning to get that shift as those people are retiring. We have millennials or whatever else you want to call us coming in that are open to not just seeing yeah, that technology is there, but actually embracing it and using it and finding a way to use it to reach the clientele better. And so um, I, I think that, um, you know, that's, that's maybe one of the biggest pushes of innovation and extension right now is some of the people, those late adopters, I think that's the, the right word for it, are beginning to phase out and those pioneers are beginning to come in. Hunter, do you think the problems that extension is being asked to address have changed uh, over time and, you know, do deference? I didn't, I don't want to call it your, you, you told us how old you were, so. Um, <laughs> I never like to have anybody, you know, who's uh, almost uh, half my age um, on the podcast. But I'm 28. I'll make, <laughs> I'll make an exception in your in your case. Um, so, you know, so I'm not asking you to go back, you know, historically. I understand you haven't been had a 30 year career in extension, um, but. Uh, uh, we say the environment's changing, the technology's changing, all those kinds of things. Are the problems changing? Fundamentally, no, I don't think so. We still have to, you know, I, like I said, I always look at things. I try to look at things in a bunch of different ways, but um, fundamentally, I'm an ag guy, home horticulture and, and animal science and forages. And we're still trying to teach people how to grow food and how to produce food for the people. And that's been the same. That's the reason extension was, was brought into existence. And so fundamentally, the job is the same, but we have a clientele now that they have inf information available to them. We just need to make sure that it's our information that gets to them instead of the misinformation that's out. What, do I, what about that question for you, Brad? Yeah, I think it brings an interesting point. Uh, you know, so often we're talking about innovation and we're saying, oh, listen to the young people, and that's true, and everybody. But, you know, sometimes the old problems or the old solutions or the old insights are the new ones, again, especially when you're a 40-something working with teenagers. And, you know, they, they don't recognize these old movie clients or the old jokes. They're all new. It's great. But uh, sometimes we have, tend to take that and forget about it. And we need to remember we have a lot of senior professionals who maybe are getting close to retirement, but they're not there yet. Or maybe they are retired and willing to, you know, still engage. Those people have great insights. And they have uh, insights that we may have long forgotten about as we look for innovative solutions to future challenges. So let's talk about some innovations then. It, it, are, do you guys have examples? And I'll start with you, Brad, of, about like what is an innovative thing that you've seen done recently in extension that maybe stands out to you as uh, giving people a model for the kind of, kind of innovative solutions they might be able to look for? You know, the cheap and easy answer is the innovation task force that e-extensions assembled. Um, I think people tend to discount the things they're good at. And so sometimes it's when you say, oh, what's, what's something innovative? If you're and seen as an innovative person, sometimes it's hard to see, oh, well, what really is innovative? But sometimes the things we might do uh, 
on our own, they seem innovative to others. Um, my boss just wanted to decide if uh, we should be conducting uh, advisory meetings in a certain way. So rather than just make an executive decision, she group sourced it to the field faculty in our state and gave everybody a chance to weigh in on it and share their insights and ideas. Uh, so I think that's innovative. I think that gives you know, people a voice in making decisions that impact them and it changes you know, what leadership necessarily uh, is. Hunter, what examples come to mind for you? Well, Brad stole my, my reference to the ECOP task force. Um, that, that was one that, that I, I appreciate him stealing that from me because that, that's, that's the one I had in my mind. And, you know, I, a quote comes to me as I was thinking about this question was um, a colleague of ours that was on the guiding committee, they said, well, what's something innovative you're doing in your state? And she said, well, I don't really think I do much that's innovative until somebody tells me that it is. And kind of like Brad was saying, it's hard to see that. But I saw something, one of your frequent guests, Paul Hill, posted a picture on Facebook the other day. And it was just on my Facebook timeline, I had a 4-H agent in Alabama and pictures, and it, it was just coincidental. It was, it was prophetic, if you will. Um, Paul Hill had a picture. He was teaching kids how to fly drones and use them to, to catch images. And our 4-H agent was showing them how to put together styrofoam planes and to throw them. And, and so just being willing to, to step out and to do something different, to try to see what the kids are interested in or to see what people are interested, to me, that's innovative. You don't necessarily have to always be on the cutting edge, but you just have to be willing to adapt and to do things in a different way. Ahead, sometimes if you're on you know trying to be on the cutting edge there's people who get on the bleeding edge of technology and it's cool but if it's so far removed from anything that you're going to be able to relate to it may not sure. be as useful as somebody who you know is just current sure. one of the things that's come up um in the conversations we've had on the podcast about innovation is the freedom to fail um and how important that is right I and mean, if you're going to try to teach people kids how to use drones. Obviously, I'm sure Paul's super prepared to do that. And I know he's got his own drone, so he's practicing. Um, but, you know, that could just flop, right? Maybe they are not interested, or maybe it's too complex, or maybe, you know, whatever, there's a crash, whatever. Um, do you feel like that uh, extension ha gives people the room to take those kinds of risks? I think I felt that way. I felt that I've always had good relationships with uh, the my superiors, and I've always felt that they had my back, and you know I kept them in the loop, and they've you know given me opportunities to try new things. So I have no complaints. I think that's maybe uh, an advantage that cooperative extension often has that other you know fields may not. True. I'm I, you know in just like Brad, I have a good relationship with my, my administration. And so I'll say, well, I'm going to try this. And they say, well, we've tried that before. And I said, well, I didn't do it. I'll try it differently. And so they, they, they tell me it's probably going to fail, but go ahead and try it if that's what you want to do. And so they allow that to an extent, I think, but you know, extension is one that we have to have programming. We have to be able to report those federal numbers. And so um, to an extent, yes, but sometimes I almost feel like we're a little boxed in. By always, we've got to have these numbers. We have to have these impact statements, and this is what it is, versus just go out and see where it goes. And, I mean, I've had a few things flop, and, I, you know, I'm still here. So I guess I do have freedom to fail, but um, yeah, I just don't know how much freedom, not the administration, but the system itself allows. That uh, it's an interesting point, Hunter, because I think um, I think I asked this question of of uh, Keith Smith, and you know, is when you have an organization whose mission is defined in legis, you know, in legislation in the Smith Lever Act, mm -hmm. um, you really have the freedom to innovate. Um, and it, it, I won't ask you guys that question, but I will ask, uh, you know, to look at the freedom to fail on a little bit different standpoint is uh, maybe our administration allows you the freedom to fail, but do your clients? How do your clients feel about innovation? You guys have different, different client bases too, so I'd be interested in both sides. Do you want to go first? You know, sure. 
Um, and I don't know if this is that different because I see, you know, we have 4-H in our office, of course, and I work with it at times. And kids, they're fun to work with, but they can also be really critical too. <laughs> so I don't want to say that, that kids are more willing to accept failure. But we, you know, we always, I've, I've been in my job now, I've been with Extension for about four years. I've been in my position for about two. And I'm set to a bar of people that have been here before me. And so if I don't do certain things or, or act a certain way in some aspects, well, I'm not as good as they were. Or I'm, you know, that, that, that hunter's just not like he was, you know. And so my clients judge whether I pass or fail, not entirely just on what I'm doing, but what on everybody else has done before me too. So my clients, I don't think, I don't think they're really open to failure that much. I mean, they might come to a program and if it wasn't that good, they would probably come back to another one, but um, they would be talking about me nonetheless. So I, you know, sometimes when you start in a new County, um, even though you may be working all weekends and evenings, uh, you're still expected to, you know, be there at eight in the morning when the extension office opens because the people driving by are going to notice if your car is not there and they might just assume you're not working and that's your base. So there's some realities in extension work. Um, I think like, I like what Hunter said about the youth is especially cause I remember as a new extension agent and we don't call him that in Missouri, but as a new youth specialist, um, I found I was very different than the last guy, but the youth liked me and they're willing to work with me on my merits. Whereas the, adults sometimes had the trouble uh, saying, well, he's not like the last guy. He's, he's, the kids think he's okay. And the kids actually thought I was all right. But <laughs> it, it's funny how the clientele differ. Um, I work at the state office now as a youth specialist, and it is a different situation where I'm kind of, I think I have more, even more flexibility to uh, innovate and to try new things, uh, understanding that at the end of the day, where regardless of where you work, you still have to produce results. And so if your results consistently are not working, then you're going to have less latitude than you did before. So, you know, I think that some of our listeners might be out there thinking about this. Um, we talk a lot about innovation and maybe it, maybe it is a very specific individualized thing, but what does to you, what does an innovative extension service look like? Um, I know some things are brought up in the task force report and I mean, feel free to, to reference those, but, but I think we're trying, you know, I'm struggling anyway to get a picture of what this, what this really looks like. And does it look any different than uh, what we do now or what, what we look like now? Or is it just, uh, you know, try harder, think, think bigger or something. Um, what do you, what does a truly innovative corporate extension service look like to you? To me, it would be, first of all, a diverse team and not just, you know, there's various uh, realms of diversity, all of which are important. Uh, I look at our innovation task force and we have people from who are, you know, starting extension careers, people like me who are in the middle of their extension careers, people, you know, near, in the near the ender, ender side of their extension careers. <laughs> um, I, but it's, you know, when we talk about getting together, I mean, this is like one of the most exciting groups of people. I, get, I get, can't wait to get together with these people. These are some of my favorite colleagues in all of Extension uh, because of what they have. And this kind of gets to your question, Bob. Uh, there's really an openness to new ideas. There's not that pride of authorship as much as the spirit of collaboration. Uh, there's interest in understanding where each other's coming from and just trying new things and taking some positive risks. So to me, a lot of that would define an innovative extension system. Um, I also think that you do a lot of this on the intake process as you're hiring people. When they first come into extension, you need to find people like Hutter who have those abilities to work in ambiguity, uh, have, have those abilities to try new things and be willing to fail and willing to try again the next time and work well with people. Uh, those are people you need. Hunter, how about you? What does it look like to you? I think, and, and this is, I think I can sum it up in a, in a few words. We need people that are willing to continue to learn. When in the field that we work in, there's always things changing, whether you're in agriculture, FCS, 4-H, there's always something new that's always there. And those people that say, I know my field better than anybody else, or, you know, you, you meet those people, um, 
they they're they're not one to want to continue to learn and to change. You know, there's there's things that I learn every day that I'm reading, studying, whatever else. Then I and I'm constantly saying, you know what? I can put that into my job. I can I can work that in. I can work that into my clients. That's something new. That's something cool. And even if it's not that cool, it's kind of nerdy sometimes because that's just the way I am. But um, you know, trying to I, I as you know, one of the issues in the um, task force report was the was hiring innovative people or a culture of change, hiring a culture of change or a culture of innovation. And that's what I look for. You can hire a smile, but you need people that are willing to learn and to change. You don't always have to have that person that knows everything. You just have to have the person that's willing to learn those things. And you know, if you're willing to learn, the chances are you're willing to accept change, you're willing to innovate or to use new technologies and to try to reach a different clientele. But if you're just stuck in the same old thing, you're probably not going to be willing to do that. Yeah, I really, I love, you know, something that you said there, hope I'm not uh, interpreting it wrong about learning things and incorporating into your work, maybe even when it doesn't seem like maybe it relates directly to your work, you know, you didn't get it out of the journal of extension. Maybe you got it, you know, on a blog somewhere and you're just, it seems unrelated and, and people, you know, the ability, it seems to me to be able to make sense of those kinds of things and make a decision uh, and be innovative about how it applies to your work. seems like a skill that maybe innovators uh, would have. Sure. And, and be, and being able to use discretion as well. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some things that we learn that will not apply or that they shouldn't be. <laughs> and being able to differentiate between those two different things. I mean, I feel like that's, it's important and that's what we do. So. Brad, what do you do to keep yourself innovative or thinking in an innovative way? You know, it's interesting. I didn't realize, I never felt like I was um, devitalized or burning out because I wasn't. Uh, but then when I got an opportunity to join this innovation task force, it really, I was amazed at what a uh, jolt it was to me and how excited it made me about not only what I was doing, uh, but what the possibilities were. So to answer your question, I think a lot of it is being open to new experiences being open to new possibilities, um, continually networking with colleagues and meeting new people and getting new ideas. I think those are the things that give you the opportunities to do just that. Hunter, how about you? Are there certain practices or things that you do to kind of stay on top of things? You know, and and Brad kind of took my answer there again, because but that's okay. But it's, it, Brad. The same, it's the same thing. You know, and, and I haven't, well, I, I say that. I work a lot of nights, weekends, long days, so I guess the potential to burn out is there. That's what everybody around me always says anyway. Um, but I found that whether it's the Innovation Task Force or if it's even other people within our organization, I look forward to sitting down at those video conferences. I look forward to going and, and meeting with other people on the on the Extension Task Force because you know, kind of like Brad said, it is a jolt. It's just fun to see what everybody else is doing and they're excited. They love extension. And those are the kind of things, if I can go and be around somebody that loves their job and it's constantly asking, how can I do it better? That's going to keep me excited. And, you know, it, it sometimes it's hard to find those people, but um, that's the, that was a good thing about the innovation task force was now I know people that are across the country that are, are just fired up about extension and the work and, and getting to help people. And now I guess if I, I start feeling down and out, I can just call up Brad or, or you, Bob, or anybody else and say, hey, I need a pep talk, get me going again. So. Uh, oh, go ahead, Brad. I was gonna say, I think that's so true. I mean, this, the fit with the role is so important. That's, I keep talking about the intake process, but really, I mean, one of the best things that ever happened to me was having a job I was miserable in for three years and where you just didn't want to get out of bed in the morning because you hated your job so much, but you had to have it because you had got to you know, eat to live and you got to work to eat. So I, for me, I mean, I've always loved this job. I've loved extension. I loved 4-H. I would do this for free if I just had a way to, you know, feed myself. But uh, <laughs> I think if you find people who love what they do, regardless of whether it's extension or anything else, that opens doors to innovation as well. Sure. This might be a little bit off topic, but it, it occurs to me as we're talking about 
who we bring in and hiring. And we've got, you know, two guests here, maybe a little bit different career stages, not to reinforce the age thing again. But, oh, that's right, Brad. I forgot your twin. <laughs> Um, that's right. Um, but, uh, has, you know, we've, we read a lot about how the workforce is changing, especially when we go to millennials and, and, uh, whatever, uh, is coming next, uh, in terms of our, our catchphrase for, you know, generalizing about a huge group of people, um, and how the workforce is sort of changing. Do you, Brad, I guess you worked with youth for a while. Do you kind of see that in terms of maybe people not thinking of work as a career, you know, as being in one place for, you know, 20 and 30 and for some of our colleagues here in North Dakota, 40 years, um, and maybe being more mobile workers? Do you see evidence of that? And how do you think that affects extension? Yeah, the group of people I've, starting with the teenagers I started working with about 10 years ago when I came back uh, into Extension, uh, they're classified as Generation Z now, and that's one of those things where social science is catching up, the marketing research has uh, labeled them this way for a while because they're a little different than the millennials. But they do tend to really look for that work-life balance. They want to make a difference. Uh, they're keenly aware that they're going to be inheriting uh, situation, uh, probably some of the worst economic and geographic c catastrophes in our nation's history. And they're, you know, the pressure's on and, and they know that. They're very entrepreneurial and they expect to work for what they get. So it's interesting to see this group coming forward. And I'm excited about the future because I'm excited about the youth I've worked with. I see what their potential is. There's, it's huge. But we can't expect everything's going to stay the same and even how we define extension, what their experience with extension is and how they've moved forward um, from recipients to maybe co-producers or maybe extension professionals. And Hunter, as someone who's relatively new in, <coughs> in your career, I know it doesn't seem like, you know, you're new, new, but uh, it's sort of like when you move into a small town in North Dakota, right? It's always, no matter what house you live in, it's never yours. It's always the <laughs> such and such house right uh, right no matter how long you're there um, so so relative to long extension careers you're pretty new I mean do you see that as being a force as we kind of go through uh, work towards the future of extension of of just a, a generation or generations who uh, don't approach work with the same sort of expectations as maybe we did 20 years ago where we thought about you know I will pick my major in school and that will be my career and I will be that, that will be my title, you know, as I work up the ladder in one corporation for until I retire. Right. Well, I think I may be the wrong person to ask this because I started my career in college. I, I kind of sort of knew which direction. I didn't know it was going to be extension, but I knew what field I wanted to work with. I started and finished with the same degree may have changed a little bit over time, but, um, you know, I always kind of knew the direction I was heading. And then when I got a job with extension and, and like Brad, I had miserable jobs too. So I was digging holes quickly, shortly before I started with extension. So I know what a good job I have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm one of those people that I am career minded. I like to think I'm in this position. It's not wasted time. It may be somewhat low paid, but that's okay. I'm working towards a good retirement and a good career where when I'm done in 2051, that's my retirement year, by the way, in 2051, I'll be able to look back and say, you know what, I think I did help a few people along the way. But I see other people where when I say words like retirement, did you, it just doesn't register to them. Like that's not something that they want. Yes, they, they are considered of, of 401ks or whatever else that people do, but you know, a good pension plan or something like that, you know, or health benefits, that's not something people think about, I don't think. And so, and, and kind of like Brad said, we have, you know, very entrepreneurial people. You have a lot of people that they don't want to work under somebody. They want to work for themselves. They want to make big money. And so I think that we're going to struggle. I don't know if this is answering the question. I may have went off topic, but I don't know if we're going to be able to have, you always have people like me or like Brad or like you that wants to hang around for a while because we've got a good thing going and, and we just so happen we get paid to do something that we love. Um, but on the other side of that, I, we've got to figure out a way to be able to keep some of the people around instead of it just being a first job out of college 
And then after a few years of getting some years under their belt, they're on to do other things. Maybe not bigger or better, but other things. There are a lot of options too. We tend to get people, we train them, and then they find, gosh, I have these skills, but I can have a career where I don't have to be working nights and weekends That's and right. there's no pressure from different, three different extension councils and things like that. Yeah, and, and in a more connected world, there's ways to have an impact and make a difference in your community or in the world that doesn't necessarily mean that you'd have to be employed by a giant organization, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, that's an interesting, I, so, sorry I got off on that tangent, but that's an interesting conversation. Maybe we'll save for, for another time. Uh, thanks, you guys, so much for talking about innovation and extension. Thanks for your work on the ECOP Innovation Task Force. I really appreciate it. It's exciting. It's fun to do it, and I'm glad to be here as well. I, I just really enjoy this. I love getting to talk to you, Bob, and, and to Brad and all the others that were on the Extension Task Force, and, you know, I, I'm excited to see where we go from here with it. So. Thanks, you guys. Brad Anderson is a State 4-H Leadership and Communication Specialist with the 4-H Center for Youth Development at the University of Missouri Extension. Hunter McBrayer is a Regional Extension Agent for Alabama Cooperative Extension. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Uh, make sure that you reach out to us on Twitter. It's at WDNEXT on Twitter. You can find us on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently. And the show notes are at bobperch.com. Working differently in extension theme music is Noon's Acid by And Nobody Cared. It's used under a Creative Commons license, and you can download it at gemendo.com. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.